Today on The Real Story, the U.S. is seeing another COVID surge and Connecticut's COVID numbers are also ticking up. So it's time to catch up with Yale School of Public Health's Dr. Albert Coe. His perspective on where we stand with COVID and what the virus and our lives could look like come the fall and winter. And GOP candidate for Governor Bob Stefanowski has chosen his running mate, Fairfield State Representative Laura Devlin. This morning, the candidates both join us. How the pair came to be and what they hope to accomplish. It's all today on The Real Story. Morning and thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. Connecticut's positivity rate in the 6% range last week, which at first is a bit alarming. But keep in mind, the state has switched how it reports COVID data, doing a rolling seven-day average for the positivity rate. And there are a lot of other factors, such as people testing at home and people not testing at all. Many are really feeling COVID burnout. Many of you might be feeling that. We know many parents out there are fried from trying to work and deal with kids having to quarantine. Our healthcare workers are exhausted from the past two years. Regardless, health experts are still urging caution, saying that COVID hasn't disappeared. It's still in our lives. So we want to bring back Dr. Albert Coe from the Yale School of Public Health to give us a temperature check on COVID in our state and what health experts are saying about us living with this virus, because clearly, you know, two years into this now, it's still here. Dr. Coe, welcome back to The Real Story. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. It's really great to be back. It is. All right, so we, we feel like we've come out on the other end of this in a lot of ways, right? We have had a lot of the health restrictions and the mandates out there lessen and be reduced. Um, and so people are kind of getting back to their normal lives, but we are seeing this uptick in COVID cases. So what are you seeing on your end? Yeah, so certainly we're seeing um, uh, increases in the cases, number of cases here in Connecticut. And, you know, if we look across particularly the north, northeast, uh, you know, there, there have been case, there are increases in cases we're concerned about what's happening in New York. And we had premonitions that something like this would happen. You know, we've seen these kind of upticks in Europe. Um, you know, many times uh, what we see in Europe happens to us, you know, several weeks to months afterwards. So it's not unexpected to have this, um, this increase in the number of cases here, here in the state of Connecticut. We have the positivity right here in Connecticut, um, you know, and we're seeing it in the 6% range, which a month or two ago is alarming. But I feel like less people are getting tested right now or less people are getting tested right now. So can you put that number in perspective for us? How alarmed should we be at that? Yeah, so, so, you know, Jen, you're absolutely right. The way that we're tracking or our ability to track, you know, how much transmission we're having you know, has certainly, uh, certainly evolved. I think one big factor here is rap rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, many of us can have, you know, get tested at home, and we're not obliged to report those that information to, to the state. In addition, uh, you know, many of the rapid tests which were are positive that are done at a healthcare pr practitioner's office or in a pharmacy, they're reported, but the negative results are. Are, um, are not reported. So that changes the denominator. So it makes it much more difficult to, or to really track trends in relative relative terms. But that said, I think, you know, we're, we are going into a phase, uh, you know, a new phase of, of this pandemic, and hopefully this a phase which will evolve to much less loss of life. But I think the first thing is, is that, you know, we've experienced an Omicron uh, variant, which is highly transmissible, but less severe, less virulent. Um, and with also with really high numbers of large proportions of the population vaccinated, we're seeing a lot less hospitalizations and deaths. And in the end run, that's what really matters. So our ability to track those hospitalization and deaths haven't changed compared to what we're seeing in cases. So there's kind of a disconnect there. Uh, that makes it ever more critical to be really on our toes that if we are going to, in the early stage of, um, of, a, of a new wave, that we, we, we detect signal, although we're going to have difficulty comparing it to how that 
that adds up to what we've experienced in the past. Yeah, that's a good point, because you, if you talk about hospitalizations, I know last week there were some, you know, 120, a little more than 120 people hospitalized with the virus. But at its height this winter, I mean, we were seeing numbers. Did we get past 900? Were we over 1,000? So I think 1,200 maybe yeah. at one point, people in the hospital yes, being sir. treated? Right, our, our, our hospitalization, and so there are a couple things that are important. One is that the number of deaths in the state was very much mitigated uh, over this, um, you know, over this past Omicron wave over the winter. Uh, much of that due to the vaccination. Um, hospitalizations were lowered uh, with in proportion to to the number of people who were infected, and and that's really we had large number of cases, but the hospitalization, relative proportion of hospitalizations was low, and that's also due to to the vaccinations, but it's also due to the fact that the Omicron variant is less less severe. So you know I think those were you know that was our experience. That's where we came through you know the the winter. That certainly wasn't the case for the United States. Um, we still had tremendous amounts of morbidity and mortality associated with the Omicron wave. And if you have to pick a finger on anything, it's the fact that people were vaccinated, large parts of the United States were, were vaccinated. We had rates up to about 2,600 you know, people dying on, on average a day here in the United States. And we have had, um, we've had as many people die during this Omicron wave than we had in the Delta wave. So I think that's the cautionary tale that, you know, um, here in our experience in Connecticut is an outlier, and that's because we've gotten a population that's been highly vaccinated. But that certainly wasn't the case in the United States. And, and, and an unfortunate amount of preventable deaths occurred in the last, last winter. Yeah, it is uh, incredibly unfortunate. And we talk about these numbers here in Connecticut and across the country, and we obviously acknowledge that this is a person, someone's family member behind that statistic, which you and I have always talked about on the show, and we want to recognize that. Um, we hear about this COVID surge, this, this bump that we're seeing in Connecticut as we've been talking about. So how concerned should people be? Should they be changing what they're doing? I mean, we're, you know, we know that we can take masks off now. People are starting to go back and do activities that they weren't able to do before. But then you hear, oh, there's another surge. There's a number bump in numbers. So where should people's mentality be at with this? Okay, so to just lay out some of the evidence as we know it now. So this is a highly transmissible um, variant. Um, the, you know, the BA1 variant, the original Omicron variant, is twice as, as um, transmissible as Delta. This BA2 variant, which is now in the state and which is taking over, is now is perhaps 20, 30, 40 percent more transmissible than that uh, BA1 variant. We're still waiting for, you know, good epidemiological evidence about those increases transmissi transmissibility. So certainly there's going to be a threat for um, you know, of transmission. It's going to be as this virus is becomes ever more highly transmissible. It's going to be difficult for our kind of tried and true ways of um, of uh, preventing infection, this is social distancing, the face mask, um, to to mitigate that risk. But on the other hand, I think we have to kind of lay out what are really the objectives and what are the really the goals that we want to protect our the health of our you know, fellow citizens in the state. And that's going to be primarily reducing the severe outcomes, the hospitalizations and deaths from that disease. And there's several things in our toolbox that work well. Uh, that in some of the things, some tools that we didn't have several months ago. So the first is vaccination. Uh, and can't stress ever more how it's important to be up to date on the vaccination. The second is the new or anti, um, the oral antiviral. Uh, there is a Paxlovid and Molnipravir, which uh, people can take in the first five days of illness. The, the important issue there is that we do have to keep testing up because we, you can't get the therapy unless you get diagnosed. And you can't get diagnosed unless you're getting tested uh, early in the early stage. So in order for that to be an effective tool in how we're going to you know, mitigate you know, kind of the harm that we're going to experience in the, during this upcoming wave or future waves, we're going to have to still rely, rely on testing, getting people tested quickly early in the, um, in the illness. And that's going to be most critical for those people who are at most risk for severe complications, the elderly, people over 65, people who are, uh, have underlying 
um, comorbidities, their underlying medical conditions that place them at risk for those severe outcomes of, of COVID. So I think cautionary note, we are going to go into a wave. That's been the experience of other countries, particularly in Europe. Other, and it's starting up here in the Northeast. Uh, but there are things that we can do about it. And you know, to remind people that if you're ill and um, if you're feeling ill and sick, to get tested immediately. Second of all, especially for those people who are at high risk for, for um, you know, the severe complications of COVID, to not only getting tested, but using many of the ways, either through the state or nationwide, to get plugged in to get into the test and treat types of, of uh, initiatives that are going on. So when you, when you say that we, we're expecting another surge, is that the surge we're experiencing now, or are we talking about the fall and the winter when we go back to a lot of indoor activities? Yeah, so so we're, we're, we are going to go into another wave. Um, you know, we, we're already seeing signal in several states, including New York City, you know, of increased uh, cases. We are seeing increased cases in here in Connecticut. As of, you know, I think the big issue, the big question is how big this is going to be. We are going into the warmer months, and we've had surges that happened in spring. Um, you can remember the alpha variant surge that we, the small alpha variant surge that we experienced one year ago. Um, but the, the big question is, is how big that surge is. I think Connecticut, the surge, is, it's hard to predict. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, we don't know how big this is going to be compared to our winter surge. I, I suspect it's going to be less so. But I think what's more important is what we can do about it and going back to getting vaccinated and getting tested and getting treated, especially if you have you're at high risk. I think, you know, from our experience, you know, certainly the winter season um, is a is a risk period for a wave. And I think all of us are thinking that we will have increased transmission in a potential wave in the winter that's going to be larger in the spring. That's certainly the case that we experienced last year. Uh, we had a smaller surge in the Fall. in the in the fall, in the fall, summer, fall, but then a much larger one, you know, when we came in the winter. So, so I think that those are the things that we, we're concerned about. We've run and, out of time, Dr. Ko, but I want to make sure we get this in. For people who are eligible for the second booster, um, let's say they got it, you know, some five or six months ago, should they be waiting a bit until the fall to, to get that booster? Or do you think they should just be immediately running out and getting that second booster? So I think there, we, we, we need more evidence to get a really well-informed um, uh, decision on, on, on whether to get the booster now or wait a little bit, because we still are trying to learn about what's the waning of immunity that may occur after that second booster. But I think uh, you know, the advice that I give my patients is that if you're in that high-risk group, you're elderly, above 65, if you have comorbidities, you're from 50 years to 64 years and you have those underlying medical conditions, it's probably wise to get the um, wise to get the boost, second booster now, knowing that you may need to get another booster in preparation if we do have a wave in the, in the winter. Okay. And I think you know, these vaccines are safe, so I think there's little downside, but with the caveat that we still have a lot more to learn about how these second boosters work. That's fair. All right, Dr. Albert Coe, always good to have you on The Real Story. Thank you so much for your expertise. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. All right, you be well. Ahead on The Real Story, Republican candidate for Governor Bob Stefanowski and State Representative Laura Devlin are a package deal. Stefanowski choosing his running mate, and she accepted. Both the candidates will join us next when The Real Story continues.